All right. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you can hear me. If you can't, please put it in the chat for our online folks. Um, welcome to the Environmental Law Institute's sixth session of summer school. The session is on the law and policy of products regulation. My name is Madison Calhoun. I'm the Senior Manager of Educational Programs here at ELI. I will be moderating this webinar today. Um, before we get started, I do want to give you all a few logistical notes. Um, as you can see, we're in person today. Uh, we also have a large audience viewing online. So we encourage both our online and in-person attendees to ask questions and stay engaged with the um, event. If you're watching online, please submit your questions through Zoom's questions box, um, and you can submit them as soon as you think of them. You do not need to wait until the end, although we will wait till the end to answer them. Uh, it's just a little bit easier for us if you submit them as you think of them. And again, please try to um, ask them in the questions box rather than the chat. And then if you're attending in person, um, you can go ahead and just raise your hand and ask questions at any point throughout the event, um, and we are happy to answer them. Um, I also want to introduce my colleague at ELI who will be helping me today for our in-person folks. Um, we have Kathy over to the side um, who will be helping out with today's session. So if you have any questions and also a shout out to Colin in the back. Thank you, Colin, for helping us with tech. If there's tech issues, uh, we will be asking him for help. Um, so thank you so much to Kathy and Colin. Um, and for our online audience, Kathy will also be helping you all um, in the chat. So if you have any technical issues, um, send her a direct message, please. My last logistical note is one, hopefully you all know if you've been viewing the series, but um, this is a, the sixth part of our series. So if you want to view the previous sessions of summer school, um, go to ELI.org and they are all posted for free for the public. Um, and then there's two more sessions, which will be the following two Thursdays after this at the same time. So if you would like to attend those, please register. I think our in-person registration is full, but if you'd like to do them uh, through the webinar, please go ahead and do that. And the next two sessions will be hazardous waste next Thursday and environmental justice the following Thursday. Um, so now I want to take a moment to thank our fantastic panelists for joining us today. They worked really hard to prepare great presentations for you all. The format of today's session will be, um, they will each give presentations and then we'll have a roundtable discussion and then we'll have time for audience Q&A at the end. Um, and before I hand things over to our first presenter, let me introduce both panelists. So first off, we have Lynn Bergeson, who is managing partner of Bergeson and Campbell. Lynn has um, earned an international reputation for her deep and expansive understanding of the Toxic Substance Control Act, uh, TSCA, the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act, FIFRA, the European Registration, Evaluation, Operation, or Authorization and Restriction of Chemicals, REACH, and especially those regulatory programs that pertain to nanotechnology, industrial biotechnology, synthetic biology, and other emerging transformative technologies. She served as chair of the American Bar Association section of environment, energy, and resources, and has served in many section leadership opportunities. She served on the board of directors at the Environmental Law Institute, the Nano Business Commercialization Association, and the Product Stewardship Society, among other business and law organizations, and lectures and writes frequently on the legal, regulatory, and science policy issues. Um, so welcome, Lynn. Thank you so much for Thank being you, here Madison. today. Thank you, Madison. Pleasure to be here. Now, our second wonderful panelist is Shanika Whitehurst, and she is the Associate mm -hmm. Director for Consumer Reports Product Sustainability Research and Testing Team. Shanika brings a wealth of experience working as an environmental scientist and program analyst for the United States EPA. Uh, while at the EPA, she led analysis, policy creation, and EPA oversight associated with the Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act, and the Safe Drinking Water Act, among other leadership roles involved with the integration of environmental justice issues into policy. Uh, she holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Environmental Science with minors in Biology and Chemistry from the University of Delaware and a Master of Science degree in Microbiology and Immunology with a specialization in Science Policy from Georgetown University. So as you can tell, we have two very uh, fantastic expert panelists for you here today. And with that, I'll go ahead and turn things over to Lynn to get us started. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Madison. And thank you for our in-person audience and our virtual audience. We have a lot of real estate to cover in this presentation. So I'm gonna spend the next maybe 40 minutes trying to go through the general architectural contours of TSCA and FIFRA. Okay, those uh, are the two key federal statutes that relate to neat chemical substances and how they are managed and regulated through the 
Yeah, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> I always forget that. Do you want me to slip on? I got it for yeah, you. Okay, great. Um, those are the two key federal laws that we're going to talk about, but recognize that there are a lot of other federal laws that touch chemical substances and the products in which they find themselves. We have the Federal Hazardous Substances Act. We have the Consumer Product Safety Improvement Act and the Consumer Product Safety Commission manages that. The Federal Trade Commission manages a tiny little sliver of this space through the issuance and management of green guides for chemicals that I'm sure Shanika is very familiar with. When you start boasting about the environmental attributes of a product, mm -hmm. you have to satisfy the Federal Trade Commission regulations. Then there are a whole host of state requirements that started years ago and have just mushroomed significantly as consumer interest and uh, NGO interest and states have grown in their interest in and regulation of perceived hazards posed by chemicals in products. So we have the California Safer Consumer Product Regulations, the California Cleaning Product Right to Know Act, uh, and all 50 different state consumer protection acts. So recognize that what we're dealing with here in, man in talking about Tosca and FIFRA today is really just a tiny but important piece of a very big puzzle, okay? So we're gonna talk about TOSCA first, the Toxic Substances Control Act. Uh, my practice in, in private practice is probably 60, 70% TOSCA and 30, 40% at any given time FIFRA. Uh, we represent industry in ensuring that their products are regulated appropriately and that they are compliant with just an extraordinarily burgeoning area of regulation. So if those of you um, here in the room or in our virtual audience are thinking about a career in the law, um, give me a call at any time. I'm happy to talk to you about career opportunities and why this is an absolutely fascinating area of law regulation and policy. So TOSCA was first passed in 1976. Does anybody know what other federal statute was passed in 1976? Yes, sir. No, but good try. Clean water. No, the Resource Conservation oh, Recovery Act, yeah. <laughs> which, which you're going to talk about next, right? Right. But RICRA and TOSCA were actually signed into law for the first time in the same year. So it was a banner year back in 76. That law was largely unchanged for the next four decades. Mm. And for any stakeholder in this space, you know that that was the source of considerable consternation by advocates and stakeholders of all stripes because the law was in many respects not as robustly implemented as Congress would have liked back in 1976. So after 10 years of congressional maneuvering and intense industry and stakeholder activism, TOSCA was significantly revised in 2016 through the Frank R. Lautenberg Chemical Safety for the 21st Century Act. And that's where we're going to spend most of our time because that's a really, really hot topic right now. So I, I just said we're only going to focus on TOSCA and FIFRA, and that's part of a much bigger mosaic of federal and state regulation. And in TOSCA, we're only going to talk about one title because that's the guts of TOSCA. We're going to talk about Title I, which is the control of toxic substances. But there are a bunch of other titles. Um, title II deals with asbestos, you know, the AHERA regulation. Some of you mm -hmm. may be familiar with that. Title III deals with indoor radon abatement provisions. Title IV deals with lead exposure reduction. Title V deals with healthy, high uh, performance schools. And then Title VI deals with formaldehyde standards for composite wood products. So if you look at all of those different provisions together and TOSCA, as it has been both originally passed and modified in 2016, there are six chemicals that are specifically called out and they include PCBs, mercury, formaldehyde, lead, radon, and asbestos. But for all the other chemicals, and at one point in time, the TOSCA inventory, which we'll talk about, had some 60 plus thousand chemical substances. Those are regulated as neat chemical substances under Title I 
of Tosca, okay? So Tosca, when it was first envisioned by Congress, it was intended to be kind of a, a, a gap-filling statute. We already had the Clean Water Act. We had the Clean Air Act. We were just getting at the same year the Resource Conservation Recovery Act. We had a lot of federal statutes, but there was no specific statute dealing directly with meat chemical substances. So Tosca was implemented to fill that void. Um, it is its unique focus is on what I call industrial chemicals. Those are chemicals that are not regulated under other federal statutes like FIFRA, which we're going to talk about the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act. If you say that 15 <laughs> times really, really quickly and don't screw up, I'll give you a prize. But FIFRA, not FUFRA, FIFRA is, deals with pesticides as defined under that. And then there's the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, which deals with law, um, uses of chemicals regulated under the uh, FFDCA by FDA. So when Congress passed TSCA 46 years ago, it wanted to ensure several goals were achieved. Number one, that EPA was always given adequate information to assess the safety of industrial chemicals. Number two, it was intended to regulate chemical substances and mixtures of chemical substances to ensure that they uh, pose no unreasonable risk when used as intended. And then finally, Congress expressed its view that chemical regulation under TSCA should never be at the expense of chemical innovation that might unduly uh, impede uh, economic um, uh, and technological innovation. So there's this delicate balance between ensuring that we have chemical innovation while at the same time ensuring that new chemical technologies do not pose unreasonable risk. And that balance has proven to be somewhat difficult. So as I noted, um, we're dealing with chemical substances used in industrial applications and consumer uses, of course. Um, a chemical substance is defined very, very broadly as any organic or inorganic substance of a particular molecular identity. Okay, so that's really big. It covers an awful lot. It excludes, as I noted, pesticides and chemicals that are regulated for federal food, drug, and cosmetic applications. Tosca regulates both chemical producers, the people that make it, the people that make it in some other part of the world and then import it into the United States, and then entities that take those neat chemical substances and process them in some way, shape, or form and distribute them as well. So if you touch the chemical and it's for industrial application, you really should be thinking about your Tosca obligations. So I mentioned early on that Tosca was significantly revised in 2016, and we're dealing with the EPA's implementation of that through three separate presidential administrations since 2016, um, which is really where the action is right now. I just wanted to briefly tick through some of the very significant changes that came into um, play with the signing into law on June 22nd, 2016 by President Obama of the Frank R. Lautenberg Chemical Safety for the 21st Century Act. Number one, under old TSCA, EPA had no mandatory duty to review chemical risks from existing chemical substances. So you might ask, well, what the heck is an existing substance? Well, at the time, an existing substance was any chemical listed on the TSCA inventory, which is this huge list of chemicals that most of which were not reviewed for chemical hazard or risk when they were first put on the inventory, which might have been as far back as 1978 or 79, and then added to the inventory after TSCA was implemented through the review and inclusion uh, of, of the chemical on the list through the PMN process, which we'll talk about. So under old TSCA, there are all these chemicals, but EPA had no duty to review them. So Lautenberg changes all that. Um, chemicals were assessed against a risk-based safety standard with no consideration of non-risk factors. That's the law now under old TSCA, non-risk factors were considered as part of the calculus of determining whether or not a reasonable risk is. Claire? Uh, you, no, okay, got it. Um, number three, under new law, unreasonable risks are identified in a risk evaluation. Any unreasonable risk found by EPA in the context of a risk evaluation must be abated. Under the old law, significant risks need not be necessarily addressed if the cost benefit calculus prevented that from happening. So in other words, you could have had um, an alternative under the um, old risk assessment standard that was found to be the least burdensome, which 
is the buzzword for a 1991 Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals decision that really blew up Tosca, the corrosion proof fittings case uh, and asbestos ruling where the court said, we're gonna invalidate EPA's review and regulation of asbestos because EPA failed to identify the least burdensome alternative. Well, under old Tosca, that least burdensome alternative might necessarily invite unreasonable risk, but it was nonetheless deemed acceptable. And Congress found that to be unpalatable for purposes of new Tosca. And then finally, EPA, well, not finally, but EPA was given enhanced authority to compel chemical manufacturers, processors, and, and importers to produce chemical data under Tosca Section 4. Under the old Tosca, EPA had to issue a rule. And as many of you know, rules take forever to come out, and then they are subject to judicial review. So EPA now has order authority, and it can say, you, 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 and you, sending you this order, generate these data, no questions asked. That's a very big deal. And EPA is using that authority right now. Um, also under old TASCA, EPA was not required to make any affirmative finding with regard to new chemicals. Um, under the new law, EPA must make an affirmative finding as to whether or not a chemical poses no unreasonable risk, reasonable risk, which will be regulated, or EPA lacks sufficient information to make a determination, in which case it can compel either the, the imposition of regulations or new data before it can make that finding. Um, under old TASCA, CBI claims, CBI meaning confidential business information, was often asserted with no kind of peeking into <laughs> the assertion to see if it really was CBI. Under new task, if you make a claim of confidential business information, you have to substantiate it. You have to corroborate it in the moment. And EPA will check those. Then finally, EPA was given a bunch more authority to compel the submission of, of more money to undertake actions that are subject to a fee. So for an example, under old Tosca, if you submitted a pre-manufacture notification to get a new product commercialized, you only had to be $2,500. And that number didn't change for a bajillion years. <laughs> now that fee is much higher. I think it's around uh, $18,500 or so. Um, and it will likely increase with a new fee rule that EPA is expected to propose soon. So in other words, there's much more um, submitter fee uh, activity to support EPA's efforts to maintain the program, okay? So let's quickly go through some of the major provisions that we, um, we face as TOSCA aficionados. Information collection is huge for EPA, and why is that important? EPA, in order to fulfill its mandate to have sufficient information to assess the chemical hazards posed by new or existing chemicals, needs information. So EPA has, as you can see on this slide, lots of authority under TOSCA Section 8 to um, get production and use information, um, all kinds of exposure information. EPA can ask for information that is required to be maintained but not submitted unless asked for um, allegations of adverse health effects that workers might submit or, or downstream customers. Uh, health and safety information, EPA can compel entities, stakeholders to generate data. And finally, if you as a uh, regulated entity, entity under TOSCA have reason to believe that a chemical might pose a substantial risk, you need to submit that information immediately to EPA. So EPA has these ongoing significant opportunities to both compel and call in information as necessary. So it has information sufficient to assess risks posed by chemicals. So with regard to that information, what if EPA determines in the course of its review that it lacks information, even though it has all that 8A, 8B, 8C, and 8E information, if it lacks information, it can use its section four authority, next slide please, um, to get more information. So as I noted, under old task, EPA had to develop a rule or engage in some sort of a consent order process to compel the generation of additional data. Now EPA has the authority and is, as we speak, issuing TOSCA Section 4 test orders to compel information with respect to the chemicals that, is, that are ongoing in the risk evaluation process under Section 6 or are about to undertake the risk evaluation process because they've been identified as the next tranche of chemicals subject to review under TOSCA. 
So Section 4 authority is, is huge, and this new authority that the agency has is very, very um, compelling. So if EPA determines that it has all this Section 8 information, but it wants more information, it then has what many of us might regard as sufficient information to undertake a risk evaluation under Section 6. Section 6 authorizes EPA to undertake that evaluation and identify risks deemed to be unreasonable given the conditions of use for which the uh, chemical uh, is being reviewed. So I had mentioned before, you know, we have this huge universe of existing chemical substances. After Lautenberg was signed into law, EPA tried to update the inventory because given the passage of 40 years, a lot of the chemicals on the inventory were no longer actually in commerce. So the agency went through an exercise where industry supplied information to the EPA to say, no, these are not active and these are active. You had to make an election, active or inactive. So now the active portion of the Tosca inventory has about 44,000 chemicals on it. And that's an important number because any of those chemicals that are identified as high priority need to go through a risk evaluation process under Tosca Section 6. So it's now 2022. 34 chemicals are going through the Tosca Section 6 risk evaluation process. Lautenberg was uh, signed into law six years ago. So you do the math, 44,000. Mm -hmm. So as I said, this is a an opportunity <laughs> to get into an area of law that will be the gift that keeps on giving for purposes of reviewing and regulating existing chemicals for many years to come, okay? So in the beginning, when Tosca was first uh, reauthorized back in 2016, EPA identified 10 chemicals from a list called the Tosca Work Plan Chemicals that it had to go into the risk evaluation process immediately. So EPA released final risk evaluations for those 10 chemicals in January of last year. So there was proposed risk evaluations and then final risk evaluations in January 2021. In January 21, guess what else happened? We had a new president that was inaugurated. And the new administration under the able uh, management of Dr. Michal Friedhoff made some important policy changes that caused some, if not most, of those 10 final risk evaluations to go back to the drawing board. Uh, there are a couple of, of major changes, which in fact, Dr. Friedhoff announced on June 30th, 2021, during an ELI webinar on Tosca at five. <laughs> uh, so EPA decided that um, some exposure pathways that were not considered under TOSCA's risk evaluation because they were regulated under other federal laws like the Clean Air Act, like the Clean Water Act, and like RCRA, might leave unreasonable risks left unaddressed. So there were a number of the final risk evaluations that went back to EPA for consideration of exposure risks addressed under the Clean Water, Clean Air, and, and RCRA but not addressed under the risk evaluation task being prepared, okay? Similarly, there was an, an assumption that personal protective clothing and equipment that workers are required to wear under OSHA standards were, were used as intended and abated those risks that they were intended to protect against. So those that assumption, Dr. Friedolf and EPA decided was an un, unjustified assumption that there might be cohorts of the community that were not protected and should be. So they went back for further review. Um, so in other words, there were several different policy changes that have caused a lot of churning with the original first 10 chemicals that are undergoing risk evaluation and an additional 20 that are in the, uh, in the, the pool to be considered under Tosca Section 6. Um, one other... Yeah, the 20 high priority and low priority chemicals decisions came out in late January 2019 and early February 2020. Under law, under Lautenberg, EPA was required to identify the next 20 chemicals to go through the process and also identify 20 low priority chemical substances that were deemed not to pose unreasonable risk. So EPA did that statutory uh, obligation timely. 
One other provision that is important um, only because of some of the commercial disarray that has uh, um, been inspired is under TASCA section 6H, certain persistent bioaccumulative and toxic chemicals, so-called PBTs, those are subject to a different risk evaluation process because they were determined to be presumptively you know, likely to pose unreasonable risk. So there was no risk evaluation. They went right to risk management and that risk management rule kicked in on that fateful day in January of 2021, January 6th, the law was issued in final where the six PBT chemicals risk management decisions were rolled out, caused a lot of commercial confusion and disarray because it specifically related to products, mm -hmm. uh, many of which we as consumers use and purchase all the time. And because there were certain hard stops in March of that year, that manufacturers, distributors, and importers were ill prepared to address. EP accommodated that, but it caused a lot of commercial confusion. So let's uh, quickly rotate to TOSCA section five, the new chemical provisions. The, you know, if you have a new chemical, it's deemed to be any chemical that is not on the inventory, right? If you look for your chemical and it's not there, it's new or it doesn't need to be there because it's exempt for another reason. And there's a bunch of different really important exemptions from TOSCA. But if you have a new chemical and you wish to get it on the inventory and to lawfully commercialize it, you need to submit a pre-manufactured notification or qualify for a lesser submission because of diminished amounts that might be used on a per year basis, a low volume exemption, for example. So, there are exemptions that are self-implementing and other exemptions that require affirmative EPA approval, but we're gonna focus just on the PMN, which is basically a big document that requires a lot of technical review to prepare and submit to EPA. So it has an opportunity to review whether or not that new chemical is likely to pose risk. So as I mentioned, one of the big, 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 big changes with new TOSCA is EPA is required now to make one of five affirmative determinations as a predicate to the commercialization of that product. And they are here. Um, I'm not going to go through them all, but the bottom line is not likely to pose risk, don't have enough information, so we might need more, or likely to pose a risk, and either you get to withdraw it or be subject to very significant uh, restriction. Um, there are lots and lots of policy issues that are in play as we speak, and I invite either our virtual audience or those of you here in the room to raise questions. I'm trying to give a very broad overview of some of the big pressing issues in EPA, which is doing a really good job of implementing a spectacularly technical and demanding law timely and well. So some of the implementation issues that have been percolating up for the past six years include the changes to the administration. But anyway, the new chemical review process is the subject of considerable discussion and EPA is working really hard with industry to ensure that new innovative chemicals that might actually be better, more sustainable, greener and cheaper than those they are intended to replace get on the market so they can do their thing. Um, EPA also has opportunities to engage in what are called alternative test strategies under TOSCA Section 4 to get away from animal testing. So EPA is working hard on validating and ensuring that alternative test strategies are embraced so we can leave our furry friends alone. Um, the, the risk evaluation process is the subject of considerable policy and legal and regulatory review because what is an unreasonable risk? What are conditions of use? What are potentially exposed and susceptible subpopulations? How is EPA to consider all of the different moving parts under TOSCA, this new law that has been now significantly re-reviewed repeatedly over the past six years with the goal of ensuring that chemicals when used as intended are safe, okay? So there's a lot going on in that space. Um, also, TOSCA Information Gathering and Testing Authority is expand, greatly expanded um, over the past several years. And as I noted, TOSCA Section 4 Testing Authority is right here right now. There are two federal lawsuits that have been submitted challenging the process by which EPA issued certain test orders and challenging the substantive merits of the test orders, recognizing that existing data might have been sufficient to fill the, the data gap or data need. So all of these issues are playing out, and I do not by any stretch of the imagine mean to imply or suggest that litigation is a bad thing. 
whenever you have a new law, you are absolutely likely to have litigation. And litigation is a good thing, right? It allows an independent tribunal to address alternative views of the law to get to a better place. So we've had seen a lot of that. And my suspicion is we will continue to see a lot of that. Um, if, if Dr. Friedhoff were here right now, she would be expressing the agency's need for considerably more resources, both in terms of money and staffing. EPA is staffing up. There are institutional capacity issues. Uh, there are resource constraints um, because in addition to doing its day job back in 2016, EPA was given this enormously complex time-driven and deadline-driven federal law to implement. And only at my significant risk and peril will I use the metaphor that is so most often used, which is EPA was required to fly the plane while it was designing it, which is not something that makes any of us comfortable. But EPA has done a great job and will continue to do a great job under very, very trying circumstances. So I'm going to uh, quickly rotate to FIFRA, and we can go back to TOSC in the context of some of the discussions that um, Shanika's comments might invite. But if anybody here in the audience has a question now in the moment, we can. OK, so I mentioned TOSCA deals with chemicals that are used in industrial applications. FIFRA is the statute that regulates chemicals used in the pesti for pesticidal purposes. I think they're trying to fix the. I just need the clicker. Oh, uh, <laughs> are, are we offline or? We are online. We're just having difficulty with the PowerPoint. So oh. we are working on it. However, everyone who's viewing. Um, Hello, everyone. Everyone is viewing uh, <laughs> online. Uh, if you go to ELI's website, ELI.org, the PowerPoint slides are there. So if you'd like to follow along while we work through this technical glitch, you can just download the slides. Um, but I so apologize for working on it. Quickly. One of the computers went to sleep. Oh, I see. I see. Well, I'll, I'll try to paint a picture verbally. <laughs> um, FIFRA, the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act, is administered by EPA and has been for many, many years. It predates TSCA by several decades. It is very comprehensive, and you, you cannot market a pesticide unless EPA reviews and approves your pesticide registration application. Mm -hmm. And that, that, that is the predicate that gets you into the market. But also, every state has its own state registration requirement. And some of those states are pretty robust, OK? So like California, New York, and Florida, because these are big agro communities, they have separate requirements that you know, are, are nothing to sneeze at, right? Um, but for the most part, the other states are largely um, Just see which slide you're on. Um, we're, we're on 27. For the most part, they're largely revenue raising opportunities. So you get your federal label, you get your registration that enables you to commercially sell and distribute pesticides, and then you get your state label, and then you can go into the market. So what is a pesticide? Anybody here want to explain to me what a pesticide is? It is any substance or mixture intended for preventing, destroying, repelling, or mitigating a pest. And sometimes people that are not deep into the pesticide world don't appreciate that it's more than just killing something, it's repelling, it's destroying or mitigating any pest. So a, a substance is considered to be intended for a pesticidal purpose that triggers the FIFRA jurisdictional requirement. If that person who sells or distributes the chemical states, claims, or implies that it can or should be used as a pesticide. So there's a good deal of intent here, and that's something that trips people up, that you might have some kind of squishy claims on your product that might suggest to the purchaser of that product that something is intended to kill, uh, repel, mitigate, or prevent. Mm -hmm. You could be inadvertently subjecting yourself to FIFRA jurisdiction because of, your, of the making of a claim that is less than clear. And a lot of the work we do 
as lawyers and, and counselors is to make sure that you are not implying a pesticidal claim, which will trigger FIFRA jurisdiction and that will in, invite an enforcement action. So in terms of the regulatory scope, um, you have several components of a pesticide. If you go to Walmart or your home and garden store and you see a can of something that you, you spray on your tomato plants, there's, you, you see an active ingredient, it's usually like 0.01%, a very small percentage. And then you have a bunch of inert ingredients that might include water and some other pixie dust to help it either <laughs> distribute or work as intended. Those are considered inerts. And of course, that term is a little misleading because although they don't have any pesticidal purpose, they're, they're not necessarily benign either, which is itself been another, which we can have another conversation on. And there are several different types of pesticides. There's the conventional ones that we all are familiar with, you know, glyphosate and some of the older legacy chemicals, a minimum risk pesticides, which are chemicals that are thought to pose less risk and hence the agency diminishes uh, requirements with regard to testing and, and um, and um, what it, what's the predicate for we're getting a, a minimum risk at 25B? Biopesticides, antimicrobials, um, and treated articles. A treated article is um, any article that is treated with an antimicrobial or a biocide. And the classic example is a can of paint. The paint often is infused with an antimicrobial or biocide to keep the paint from spoiling. That antimicrobial in the paint is not intended to provide pesticidal or germ protection on a treated wall, a painted wall. But if that paint manufacturer puts on their label, includes an antimicrobial that provides biocidal um, strength, you've just made yourself a pesticide. And marketing that paint with that claim is a violation of FIFRA. So the treated article exemption, as it's called, has given rise to significant discussion over the past gajillion years. Um, and people need to be very careful about the inclusion of an antimicrobial to protect the article itself and not to bestow pesticidal potencies or properties to the wall that might have been painted by that, that paint. Um, pest, uh, FIFRA, just like Tosca, is um, for new chemicals pre, subject to pre-market approval. So you can't market a pesticide unless EPA has signed off on it. And there are R and D provisions and stuff like that, but for the most part, it's pre-market approval. It is a risk-based safety standard for non-food uses. The safety standard is no unreasonable risk, similar to Tosca. For food uses, the standard is reasonable certainty of no harm. And how those standards are expressed differ a little bit, um, but they're less fluid than they are under, under Tosca right now. The legal burden is squarely on the registrant to make the showings, all right? So you have to have the data, you have to make the case that your new pixie dust or new use of an existing pesticide does not pose an unreasonable risk or poses no, um, poses certainty of no harm. Uh, FIFR is very use specific. So if you look at a pesticide label at a store, you'll see that it will dictate exactly what you can use that pesticide on. It's not like for general use against insects, no, it's what kind of insects and that specific um, condition of use is, is required. Um, the process of getting a registration, we've been doing this for literally decades, is hugely labor intensive, very expensive, and requires a submission of boatloads of data. And to its infinite credit, EPA has an extraordinarily gifted set of scientists and risk assessors that review these data against well-established standards of, of um, scientific rigor. Um, it's expensive uh, and it takes a long time. Uh, data development can be well into the millions of dollars and then you can get your, your new chemical. Um, there, there's a one little provision that we do a lot of work in called data compensation. So say you're a, a chemical company, you've just spent $15 million in six years to perfect a brand new active ingredient that's never been used before. And you get your ticket punched. EPA rewards that innovation by giving you 10 years of exclusivity in the market. But what does that mean? It means that for 10 years, since the date of your registration or the issuance of your label, nobody else can rely upon your data. On 10 years in a day, other registrants can rely upon your data to get into the market. And they are accelerated in the market because they didn't have to develop all those data and they didn't have to spend a gajillion dollars, right? 
but you have to offer to pay the data owner for the right to cite their data. And these offer to pay give rise to administrative tribunals called data compensation arbitrations if the parties are unable to agree upon a fair and reasonable amount of the compensation. Very, very interesting area of the law. Uh, like Tosca, FIFRA provides lots of opportunity to protect confidential uh, information. One's confidential statement of formula is the holy grail. That's your magic pixie dust that nobody but EPA knows. And EPA does a terrific job of protecting it. Your label, um, the label is very much scripted by EPA according to rules um, that the, are, are in 40 CFR. So everything that you see on a, a pesticide label is reviewed and approved by EPA and the registrar. Conditions of use, precautionary statements, your confidential statement of formula is not included, but you have to at least put what the active is. And a lot of people put their inerts down, but you're not required to. So the label is very, very important. Uh, with regard to the new actives, and now if you have a submission before EPA under either getting a new active ingredient approved or a new use for an existing chemical, you submit it and you can pretty much understand how long it will take and how much it will cost through the Pesticide Registration Improvement Act or PREA program that kicked in a number of years ago, very effective and it gives the regulated community a very predictable system by which new uses and uh, new products can be reviewed and considered. Uh, right now, EPA is going through a process of reviewing uh, older registrations, um, and it is required to complete that review you know, later this year, and it's on track, I understand, to do it, the review of older pesticides against new standards. And EPA ensures under FIFRA that even though chemicals were reviewed and first regulated or first registered by EPA maybe 40 years ago, it's a continuing process of review against new standards and new technologies. So EPA does a, a great job on that. Um, EPA is, of course, very supportive um, and solicitous of safer or reduced pesticides and has a separate program for that. Um, incentives to have a safer, greener, uh, active are reduced fees, diminished EPA review, and dedicated resources to achieve that result. Um, so it, it's nice to know that that is a mature, well-oiled machine at the agency that uh, the public can take comfort in knowing it exists. Um, Lots of enforcement going on, particularly with the advent of the pandemic. You know, any of the disinfectants that are used to con um, uh, to address COVID um, and uh, SARS-CoV-2 are antimicrobials. So EPA did a brilliant job of quickly converting some of its internal resources to accommodate the easy but sufficient and, and safe uh, review of chemicals. Uh, so this so-called list and list of biocides and disinfectants that could be used to combat um, SARS-CoV-2 uh, went from like 85 to over 500 over the course of the, the pandemic. Uh, EPA has lots of enforcement tools, which it is definitely using these days, stop sale and use restrictions, civil penalties, criminal penalties, um, and so forth, and, and EPA, is really active right now at the border if you're bringing in pesticide devices, which we didn't talk about, but or have problems um, uh, with your label. The agency is, is being very, very active in that regard. So it's a huge area of enforcement. Um, didn't talk about the Endangered Species Act, but obviously ESA works closely with our friends in the pesticide office to ensure that pesticides do not compromise endangered species. Uh, registration review is underway, should be completed by September 30th. EPA is working on its so-called pollinator policy to make sure that pesticides are not contributing elements to the diminished uh, colony of, of um, pollinators. Uh, there are some legal issues that are interesting with regard to Prop 65 warning and FIFRA preemption for the, the legal beagles in the audience. We have a lot on our website on that. Um, and again, EPA's FIFRA office struggles with some of the same challenges institutionally that the uh, toxics office does, which is institutional capacity, an aging demographic, people retiring, and new employees coming on, and uh, resource shortfalls. But the agency is doing a great job of managing all of those. So we can circle back on some or all of these topics after uh, Shanika gives her remarks. So thank you very much, and we'll turn it over. 
thanks to you. I, I, it's not a failure that I learn something new every day. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> so thank you for uh, going through those statues. Um, and thank you guys for having me. You want to? Um, yeah, we're having issues. This computer was what was controlling the slides originally, and uh, it's not controlling them okay. anymore. So it's back there that we're the gremlins. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Um, so, Kathy, if you could uh, switch Rem the slides over to um, a few yeah. more. But while we're waiting for that, I, I can at least um, preface the discussion. Um, well, here we go. So. <laughs> Uh, thank you guys for having me today. Um, as Madison said um, before, her name is Shanika Whitehurst and Associate Director for Product Sustainability Research and Testing. That's a long title, which really just means sustainability, right, <laughs> at the end of the day. Uh, so I'm here to talk about our Green Choice Evaluation. Uh, that is essentially what I was brought in to do. So when we look at what Consumer um, Reports does, our bread and butter, right, is to provide those ratings and provide that information out to the public at large. Uh, we sit very nicely in, in a place to be able to influence the market overall, um, being that uh, our work with manufacturers, but also um, our reach within the consumer base as well. So that sets us up um, for a lot of success. Um, so it was good I can lay that out <laughs> in the beginning. Um, and you can see as, I, as I'll go through the slides, how our program will kind of feed into that as well. Okay. So. Next slide. Uh, Kathy, if you could go to the next slide, please. There we go, yeah. thank you. Well, we've got next slide. <laughs> next one after that to you. No worries. All right. So. Um, Green Choice actually started um, prior to me coming. So I've been in Consumer Reports now for a little over a year. Um, they last in 2020, um, I should say, yeah, in, no, 2021. So last spring, uh, Green Choice was first applied to automobiles, uh, preferably using um, EPA emissions data, also combined with um, uh, miles per gallon, so the so the gas mileage data, just to do a ranking, a quick quicker ranking um, of vehicles that are not only saving money in theory of the gas pump because of the miles per gallon, but also don't contribute as much emissions um, to the overall um, climate. So what you'll see in both the auto side and then the home product side, in which I deal with, is there's a little green leaf that tells you, okay, this product is greener than others. It's been deemed a green choice. Next slide, please. Oh. <laughs> okay, so, so also last year, prior to, to me coming, we ran a green choice for uh, washing machines. Um, that was the first attempt with it. Um, now, upon my arrival, I've taken what we did um, in the very beginning of last year and we've transitioned it, if you will, and evolved it, um, the, uh, evolved the overall calculation and equation up to a point where it is inclusive of, um, of a lot more factors than we looked at initially. But uh, the green leaf emblem, that still remains <laughs> so that on our website, you can um, definitely tell which washers are green choice. And then also this year we expanded to dishwashers, um, just as a case in point to prove that um, the equation can, can be applied to more than just one um, product category um, for large appliances. Next slide, please. All right, so some questions that we get is how do you know which things to work on? So um, from a sustainability standpoint, how could consumer reports understand are people gonna care that something's greener or not? All right, and a lot of that information we get are from nationally representative surveys, okay? So those surveys, this one in particular is conducted, we, we just did one in March um, of this year. And that was trying to understand from a consumer standpoint, um, is sustainability important to you? Right. So in regards to buying a large appliance, um, in regards to environmental concerns. So those are the type of questions um, that people um, 
people get. So um, we talk about large appliances. We apply the question to small appliances as well. Um, on from a from a um, Tosca standpoint, um, the chemicals that would be used in the household, um, all of those things expand out as well. So chemicals meaning cleansers and, and things like that, not, not so much the industrial chemicals. So after that survey in March, you see we had about 58% said they bought an appliance um, in, in the past five years, which fed the need to, okay, let's start with the appliances. We know that we have something there. And then we have um, over about 55% saying that environmental concerns of being energy consumption, but also water consumption was very important to them, okay? And we'll see in particular how that last point feeds into um, the overall green choice. Next slide, please. All right, so historically, as you heard me mention before, CR's bread and butter has been ratings, okay? So how well is this refrigerator going to work when it comes home to you? How well is this washing machine going to work? Is it going to be gentle on your clothes? Is the brand maker reliable? Um, how much energy does it use? All of those questions have been answered in our evaluations, right, historically. And those evaluations really just focus on what I like to call the use phase. That is when the product is in your house, it's plugged in, and it's doing what, is, what, what it has been made to do, right? So... Our green choice now, next slide, opens it up. So when I came in, one of the, well, one being, being struck with the question of how can we determine the greenness of products is a, is a difficult one to, to tackle, um, particularly because we, we give rankings to all types of products. We consumer goods, consumable goods. Um, so. So the challenge was, how can we think of an evaluation that can go across the board or broad categories, uh, whether we're talking about large appliances, small, lawn and garden, uh, sunscreens, everything, right, under the sun. Uh, and part of when, when I came in, the thought um, came because every product, regardless of what it is, goes through about three phases. Okay, it starts in the manufacturing. There's always some manufacturer making it somewhere, right? Um, when you bring it home, there's, there we go. That's what our ratings really um, pertain to from a performance metric standpoint. And then everything goes from to a disposal phase. Some takes longer from start to finish than others. And then you have things like lotions or sunscreens where it's made, it's shelf liable for a certain point in time, it may be used once if we're talking about sunscreens, left out and then tossed, right? So you can see that um, in those evaluations, if you will, they, it, it brings up an overall life cycle that these products have. Now, life cycles um, for some folks that may ring a bell and like makes other people's ears put up because if you think of a life cycle analysis, is this broad document and talks about every aspect of of the product. There are some aspects of that that go into the evaluation, yes, but it is more so making sure that, that those distinct phases can be represented in this evaluation that we're putting together. And when you look at them all collectively, that's what we come up with when we talk about green choice for home products. Next slide, please. All right, so <clears throat> from a characteristic standpoint, when we're talking about manufacturing, we're talking about anything that is in control of the manufacturer. Not, you know, oh, we would really like to see this. Or how is it shipped to your house? Those are all out of your control, right? You can control the speed at which it gets to your house, yes. But if it's gonna be shipped in a crate, if it's gonna be shipped in a cardboard box with styrofoam, all of those decisions are not ours. All right, so manufacturing decisions include those, it includes sustainable design. Is it designed in a way that it can be easily taken apart, um, recycled? Um, what type of materials are used in the construction of it? Are recycled materials used, meaning um, pet plastics uh, to a certain degree can be used and reused um, to make different moldings now? Um, or is it heavier than something else, which, which 
sometimes, um, depending on the design, that, that comes into play, all right? Um, the obvious environmental impacts of the manufacturing of that particular appliance comes into play as well, all right? Um, nothing is just magically brought to us. Um, and as we've gone through the um, listening about Pfeffer and also Tosca, right? Those types of impacts have to be taken into account to a certain degree as well. And then we talk about resource conservation. Resource conservation um, from a standpoint of all those raw materials have to be sourced from somewhere. Now they do relate back to design. Um, it does relate back to environmental impacts in the sense that if those raw materials you're using, you can use less of them. They can be um, prepared differently or procured in a more sustainable fashion. Those are the things that we're, we're um, taking a look at. Next slide, please. And um, I, I just want to say, ultimately, when we look at the program, because it, it, it is designed to evolve, is that these are the ultimate pieces that um, you hope and want to get data for to be inclusive um, overall in, in the calculations. So in the use phase, again, we're still looking at environmental impacts. Right, so when we take a look at um, particularly energy consumption, for instance, uh, residential energy consumption from an annual standpoint is about 20, uh, equates to about around 25% of the overall uh, greenhouse gas emissions, right, that come when we look at them collectively. And that's just residential use. That's not including manufacturing, which is separate, but less, <laughs> strange enough, but when we look at what is our impact, those, um, those things like energy consumption, those things like water consumption really come into play. Particularly um, for me, probably working in the Austin water <laughs> for so long at EPA because it's a finite resource, right? So is it um, one, not just did it take a lot of water to make it, is it using the water? If so, what is the impact on that? Is it adding, is the wastewater adding to water quality issues that may be out? Um, is it, you know, the, the, depending on the way that the appliance could be structured or hoses could be connected, does it stand a chance for leaks? That's where reliability comes in and, and all of those factors get considered. Then we can ask a question, mm -hmm. is, is the use, um, when you said water quality, is that considered at the manufacturing level of the appliance or at the user level when used as intended? This is now the user level okay. when, when used as intended. Uh, part How of- How granular is that review? So that's the, that's the portions of where I'm saying this evolving. Okay. So the part um, where it would be at a manufacturing right. standpoint mm -hmm. would be up, up, up if you take a step up before mm -hmm. the product even gets to you. Right. Um, as to um, from the degree that we conduct research and mm -hmm. um, we have a basic understanding of how much um, resources mm -hmm. go into like, let's say making one washer of this composition of mm -hmm. components, that's, that's what you would be looking at. Does that okay. cause or, or present a water quality issue? Maybe if it's applicable, mm -hmm. right? But um, one, if it's applicable. Two, if there's data, that hard data to right. to to um, support mm -hmm. that conclusion. So all all of these seems like it's pie in the sky, right? <laughs> to a certain degree, but when you really look at how things are structured, the way that we do things at Consumer Reports, if the data does not show it, if the data is not there, it's not an assumption, it is the data shows that the electrical consumption is this during testing, or the data shows that this much water is being consumed, right? So um, one of the, the good things about the way that this evaluation is set up is that as more data is procured, then it makes the evaluation even more robust. Um, at, the, at the end of the day. And so that's really what we're going for because the likelihood, whether, you know, whether it be at CR or APA or something, you get everything at one time <laughs> to base everything off of would be amazing. <laughs> but the likelihood is very small um, that, that that happens. Can I ask you another question? Mm -hmm. Are those data harvested by you and your staff or do the manufacturers contribute to the data 
to help with the analysis. So the, the data that, so particularly in the use phase, so our performance testing, our comparative testing and analysis, mm -hmm. that's all done in-house. Okay. So we have a particular rigor set up um, for testing, mm -hmm. regardless of washers, dishwashers, TVs up and down the line. And so that data is generated by us. Okay. And now the data that people see when they open up the magazine or you go on to see our online, that, that is some, that's a, a, mm -hmm. a picture of some of the data points that, that we collect, but mm -hmm. there's more beyond that, okay. that can go into evaluations such as mm -hmm. those. So um, I just also want to point out from a societal impact perspective, right? One of the things when we look at sustainability, people ask, what is it, right? Because you hear it thrown here, thrown there, it can mean one thing or the other. If you really think about it and you break it down, it is the ability to continue to do your activities, whether it be manufacturing, whether it be just living your life on the day to day, without further destruction or impact, on the climate around you. That's the, that's the term that, that I apply to it. Being that we can still have commerce, we can still sell commerce, we can still um, create um, different chemicals or appliances in a balance, right? It's, it's, it's a nexus um, type approach with it. So when we look at, um, from a societal impact standpoint, you are looking at things as exposures in some cases or safety comes up into play. So those types of, of factors do get looked at. Um, next slide, please. And so then in the disposal phase, everything gets disposed, right? <laughs> in some way, shape or form. Some things are, are completely uh, dismantled or <laughs> as I learned, um, some of them are completely shredded <laughs> and then sorted apart, which, which seemed amazing to me, but, um, talking to scrap yards, talking to, to metal processors and those, those are all part of the discovery that comes into um, this evaluation. And like I said, sometimes you receive very hard data from places that you wouldn't expect, but these folks process um, these large appliances all the time, every day, and then have the information and in those pieces to show for it. Um, and then also from a disposal perspective, you do still have societal impacts, right? But some of the things that, that could be disposed um, landfill wise, right? Our landfills are filling up, you know? Um, also, not just that, you have some things that are, that are there, like you heard me talk about sunscreens earlier, right? If there's, let's say, still product left in, in, in the bottle, what happens to that? You know, the degradation factors, it's still going somewhere. It, it, the chemicals may have um, gone into dissolution, but they're gonna leak out and go somewhere. Um, and understanding to a certain degree, if that affects groundwater, right? If there's um, some contamination factors and things like that, um, that have to be taken into account. Those are all things that we look at as from a product category, product category basis, but it's not this big, clean, um, I guess, disclaimer that we put on, this is happening. It's more so as we move from category to category, we research the topics, um, journal articles and, and all of that to support and back up on um, the claims that are involved in the, in the actual equation. Next slide, please. I keep looking at you, Madison, and I know it's not yet. <laughs> uh, so just to give you guys an idea, when we looked at washing machines, these are some of, some of the inputs that went into the overall um, evaluation of it, right? Um, with some of our comparative testing um, and some of our analyses, um, the way this one was structured, we have some inputs that carry a larger weight as they should, right? We're talking about um, what is green, right? At the end of the day. And if you take that greenness and apply it to the climate climate impact or the climate environmental structure at hand, those are some of the things that come into mind when, when you're looking at these are weighted more than others, okay? So energy efficiency, definitely in there. You heard me talk about water consumption, um, water efficiency, those things are in there. Volume, weight, um, some of those, those basic pieces are there. And I, I get that question all the time, right? Well, why is weight? included. Well, weight in this particular instance is 
looked at as if we know how heavy that is, we can um, we can make a claim to to kind of backtrack and figure out the amount of resources that were used to go into it, right? And to go back to your question about manufacturing data, um, in as we evolve the equation, some things yes we'll we'll get from the manufacturer, but not a lot. We rely mainly on our testing for that. But as far as like composition mm -hmm. of the overall machine, that type of information, yes. Um, one, because manufacturers have their specs that go out to the consumers and the public. Um, and then um, I guess also for just proper consideration, providing that information as well. Mm -hmm. So that that part, um, We'll, we'll start now that Green Choice has been fully established uh, within consumer reports. But this just gives you an idea of that. Next slide, please. All right, so from this year, right, um, and I can say um, with the um, introduction of the new equation for Green Choice, we have about 20% of all the washing machines that CR provides ratings for are Green Choice designations. Now, does that mesh up with are highly recommended um, uh, appliances. In some instances, yes, in others, no, which is exactly where in constructing this evaluation, where exactly where we want it to be. There's no guarantee that's just because something's highly recommended is gonna be the greenest choice. Um, nor, nor is there a guarantee that says, you know, the $1,800 washing machine is also the greenest choice. Right. It, so that's where our performance testing and those evaluations really do come into play here. Um, and, and looking at factors like weight, looking at factors like volume, those really play a role um, because people want to be, for the most part, greener. This is just an opportunity to be greener in the appliances that you may want to purchase and buy um, in, in, in that fashion because you're just using less of the water and less of the energy at the end of the day. Um, next slide, please. So dishwashers, same type of evaluation, right? So one of the things that, um, as uh, you pointed out, Lynn, with um, EPA, where you have to go step by step by step all the time, it's the same thing here. As we go from category to category, each appliance has its own specific things with it, right? Now, washers and dishwashers are different, but they both use water, they both use energy, um, there's with dishwashers, you have different components that have to be taken into account, um, different interior materials where um, washers is a little bit more standardized from a stainless steel perspective or um, not so much ceramic coated anymore, but most of the drums are, are somewhat um, standard from that standpoint. With dishwashers, you still have some that are in their stainless steel inside, some are all plastic inside, some are composite of both, right? And how do you take that into account? Like, so that comes into account from a durability standpoint. You buy something, the expectation is gonna last, right? That's at least the expectation. And even though like, for instance, plastic is lighter and that's a question that, that I get, it's not as durable. And so when you're, when you're doing those ratings and doing those scorings, those type of factors come into play too, as well. Um, next slide, please. So again, we have around 20% uh, is, is, is about the benchmark this year. Um, when we looked at um, dishwashers as well, so that's, again, if you were to go on our site, um, you would see a little green leaf um, around those um, models that were green choice designated this year. Um, we do have a slight, about 20% of the recommended models were also um, designated, which, you know, if it was more like 80 to 90 to 100%, it'd be like, oh, maybe we have to look at um, some things. But like I said, I think that's a nice, healthy um, range as a first year benchmark um, for it. Because again, we're getting at what is the greenest, not what is the greenest and recommended and best buy for you. That's great if it meshes up with all those things, but the point is we're looking at what is the greenest appliance. Next slide, please. Oh, okay, question. Um, have you been able to secure data about um, how like, these grant certifications have been affected consumer purchases? 
Um, so this year, um, being that we have now expanded out the dishwashers, that's the that's, um, data that we're working on obtaining now um, from um, different consumers that are either access, accessing the information online or through the magazine. So uh, that, uh, especially because this uh, green choice with wash, washers and dishwashers was released last month, um, early last month. So we're in the earlier stages of collecting that information, but um, hopefully that's definitely something we should have um, within hopefully the next six months or so. They really see how it's performing um, out there. Um, now, Future categories, like I said, you know, you definitely have your other large appliances that are going to be involved with that. But we're also looking at small appliances, um, so air conditioners, uh, microwaves, um, fridges will get there, televisions, of course, um, when we break, um, go move on to um, electronics, and then um, also. Um, uh, consumer goods, consumable goods that are that are going to be evaluated as well. So um, it's definitely an, a large undertaking. But um, when we look at the marketplace and we look at how we want to influence the marketplace, it is important from the standpoint that consumers have that choice, not just the choice, but the information to properly make that choice. If they want to be greener, this is this is at least a, a family of some options for you, right? And then from there, hopefully as more and more people maybe choose the greener option, you can influence the manufacturer maybe to, um, for greener manufacturing practices all the way around, um, or just to start making the machines, designing the machines to be more sustainable when it comes down to it. So that, that's still a possibility. Yes, ma'am. In the data, have you seen like spikes of sales during like Black Friday or Memorial Day sort of holidays or? Definitely, we definitely see spikes of sales during those major holidays. Why? Because that's when you're going to see the most discount <laughs> for it, right? Um, also, um, on the website in particular, um, we usually have like, when's the best time to buy this uh, or when, you know, when's the best time to buy an air conditioner or a heater or, you know, on down the line. So we provide that type of information to folks too, because just because it is maybe a big Labor Day weekend sale does not mean that's the best time to buy it, if that makes sense. Yes, ma'am. Um, how do you see Green Choice working with other certification systems like Energy Star and other things that are like worth like, do you see them as kind of, you know, partners? Have you like worked with? I'm just kind of curious how they interact. So with um, Energy Star, that we look at that as more. It's more information that's out there in the market. Um, well, market is out there in the public, right? Um, Energy Star, um, based on their testing and. Um, and the way that the uh, the savings are calculated and such, you have to be be very specific as to like what actually goes into that calculation. Um, when CR, for instance, we're doing our energy um, consumption or water consumption, we have our own methods um, to evaluate that. So we do look at that information, but it's not a one to one comparison. But you can look at it to to somewhat. You know, somewhat um, not verify is the wrong word, but when you're looking at at different points of consumption, um, and depending on on the way that they've calculated, like the per load, um, such, I'm just just making sure that it's somewhat in step to a certain degree, um, or if we're seeing something else or something different from that, that's all things that are are taken account of and, and looked at as well, because we do have um, parts of the organization that deal um, you know, with um, government. So we have a whole policy side um, to consumer reports. So they may work for the Consumer Protection um, Safety Council uh, on, you know, like more recently uh, when the treadmills were just starting by themselves and children got hurt. I think a couple of, of, of pets unfortunately got, got hurt. And then that, that sparked the, whole, the huge recall 
for that particular treadmill, this poses a threat. And then those, those, that type of information we looked at, we received, processed, and then you know, we have our, our folks that work directly with that particular agency. Um, we have on our also on our policy side folks that work directly with EPA, um, whether it be the um, Office of Air Radiation. Um, I'm sure as we get to more um, household goods or cleaning products, um, possibly working with the, with the um, Tosca folks right. as well, um, or in some instances, PFRA. Um, but that's really from our performance testing, but it could also be from um, claims that are that are out there that people are people are reporting um, because someone's getting hurt, maybe getting burned, a rash has been caused, you know. So it's a whole. Um, it it could be a whole swath of reasons that can be independently investigated, and so that's that's the other positive part that I look at about CR that we can we can take a claim, we can take a situation. Um, try to, in, within our laboratories, um, set up the um, conditions that, that, you know, sort of repeat what that person was doing, what was happening, and then test it ourselves, right? And then speak upon that. Um, maybe not so much all the time to the public, but also do those type of evaluations that help also our policy arm, as they may have to go on the hill um, for, you know, talking about the, the whole number of, of issues, um, whether it be infrastructure to a certain point where there was a lot of um, car um, safety pieces, but um, emissions and um, uh, talk around gas mileage and, and that type of thing that was ongoing. Or, you know, even we have a digital part that talks about digital safety. Um, and, you know, when um, bills and such come up like that about privacy um, software, uh, with appliances now are, are getting more and more, you know, is it Wi-Fi driven? Is it sending you a message? Is it telling you, hey, you're out of, uh, you're out of um, uh, washing liquid, you need more. Um, but what are the privacy sets, setups to protect that particular consumer as well? So as things are expanding, we are trying to expand and um, evolve ourselves as an organization like Yes, ma'am. When you're entering a new product category, do you engage with industry to kind of see what some of the oh sorry? <laughs> um, when you enter a new product category, when do you engage with industry to see some of the unique challenges that might come with a different type of product, like you know, moving from microwave ovens to vacuum cleaners, mm -hmm. or as you mentioned, some cleaning and household products? So um so one of the other other um, big pluses I, I can say with CR is like, so I'm a trained scientist. I work for, for Consumer Reports. It's a scientific organization. Is that we have, you have folks like me, you have folks that can go down on the hill and argue <laughs> certain points or factors um, that should be in bills. Um, but we also have um, our market analysts. And our market analysts are, are um, are definitely such a benefit because just like that question you asked. Now, I could go directly to the manufacturer, but our market analysts know pretty much like which category you're going into, the ins and outs, the volumes of sales, uh, what is the, the newest types of models, what features could be on those models. Um, so, you know, so it's it's kind of like having that first, but you can understand the whole market from them and not just one particular brand because we don't work with one particular brand. Like CR's whole thing is we're not trying to say, oh, we want Miele to be the best or Bosch to be the best. It's like whoever's the best is the best, right? And that is from our comparative testing. If it comes out that way, okay. But um working hand in hand with one manufacturer or the other, that, that doesn't really come into play. Because we have, we have so much um, wealth of knowledge in staff that luckily we don't have to do that. But um, I, the caveat I will say on that is, is 
to a certain degree, understanding certain, if there's a special complexity with a category, that won't be um, something that's, that's held out of the equation, but it's, it's held in regard with the other information that could be received as well. No problem. Yes, ma'am. Is the consumer choice to opt for a greener product cost agnostic? In other words, are people prepared to pay more for a green attribute? So one of the things that we push for both on a policy side, but also um, in these evaluations is, is um, on both the slide for washers and mm -hmm. dishwashers, price was up there. And I right. get asked that question all the time. Why is price effective? Well, one, one, thing I usually push back with is what's the what's the use of having this greenest and green <laughs> appliance that is three and a half times more expensive than anything else on the market right. and no one's buying it then is it being beneficial no right if you look at what is that cost to access and if when we look at CR our position in the market if we can help from our evaluations bring that cost of entry down, then you can have more people that can, you know, productively go purchase that appliance and, you know, have it actually installed and working in their household. So then collectively, you can see that impact start to unfold, as opposed to just this few that, you know, you maybe have $2,000 to spend on a washer. And that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But not everyone has that. And it's, it's, it's looking at why should consumers in general have to pay more to do the right thing at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. And so in trying to drive that marketplace change, that is one of the um, one of the foundations that, that runs through it. How, how can we help bring the overall cost down so that people that want to do the right thing can? And that, that is, um, you can see that in the home products category or even in automobiles. Um, as well. Any other question? Please, that's all good. Any any online or are they inaccessible? Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. Do you want to go ahead? Oh, and we have, forgot about the guys uh, on online computer. We also have roundtable ones, but I prefer to go to the audience first. Yeah. Uh, so we have one question for Lynn. Uh, will the recent Supreme Court decision in West Virginia v. EPA affect how the EPA can regulate chemicals? So that's a very good question. As everyone knows, the Supreme Court made a very important ruling um, a couple of, I guess it was a week before last in West Virginia, the EPA. Uh, that related to Section 111D of the Clean Air Act. Mm -hmm. But the court basically took the position that when you have a major question um, or invoke the major questions doctrine, how far, how much discretion does an agency have? to veer from what at least this court determined was the true intent of, of the provision. Um, given the way the majority decision as written by Chief Justice Roberts was prepared, I would expect that every advocate on planet Earth is going to be optimizing the West Virginia v. EPA argument, mm -hmm. uh, particularly where you have an agency that is dealing with very, very challenging socially dynamic issues like toxic chemical regulation, climate change, in this case, in the Clean Air Act. Mm -hmm. You know, I gave EPA a lot of credit for being innovative in interpreting 111D to apply to a cap and trade system to ensure that um, energy generation was, was shifting to a, a different generation source. The court thought otherwise. Uh, and thought that if Congress wanted that section to be used in that dramatic, um, mm -hmm. transformative way, it would have said so. Um, but as, as those of you that read the Kagan dissent, you, you appreciate that Kagan gave EPA, in this case, much more credit for utilizing the resources that it had at its disposal to tackle very challenging, socially dynamic issues like climate change. Applied in the Tosca context, you know, the EPA is similarly working with some very fast-changing, technically challenging issues. 
Uh, one of the issues we really didn't talk about was EPA's shift to whole chemical approach, meaning that when the agency conducts its risk evaluation of a chemical, it conducts it based on conditions of use that are thought to pose a reasonable risk. And under the agency's new approach, it will look at the whole chemical in making a determination as to whether a chemical poses an unreasonable risk versus just whether certain conditions of use of that chemical pose an unreasonable risk. And if a majority of those reviewed conditions of use are thought to be unreasonable, then the whole chemical will be deemed to pose an unreasonable risk. You know, is that likely to be amenable to some sort of major questions, doctrine analysis in some forthcoming Supreme Court case? I don't know. But I would expect advocates that are unhappy on either side of the equation to be making these arguments. Um, Itasca Horse is a very new, or Lautenberg is a very new law. The Clean Air Act has been around forever and one right. like indeed being used in such a transformative way. Uh, might be more amenable to a type of major questions doctrine analysis than anything that might be derivative of Lautenberg. But in answer to the very good question is, I would expect that argument to be used by advocates, particularly in courts that are thought to be more conservative and likely to mm -hmm. similarly um, embrace the analysis that the, um, the Roberts decision did in West Virginia, the EPA. How successful they will be, I have no earthly idea. <laughs> Uh, I wanted to go back to, you know, the regulation of pesticides, and I was wondering, what's the definition of a pest? You know, I don't have it right here, but it's broadly defined to include um, bacteria, animals, uh, insects, things that are defined under the statute as being amenable to, you know, what you might imagine, you know, a pest to be. It is very broadly defined. And so a pesticide is anything that is intended to mitigate, repel, kill, or you know, address that, that pest. But it does include um, bacteria and uh, microbial organisms, hence the antimicrobial division of the EPA, which is probably one of the, it and the bios, um, biochemicals division, probably the most active these days, as opposed to conventional pesticides for agrochemical uses. We have a kind of similar question in the chat. Um, this person is asking that in the agricultural world, an herbicide is classified as a pesticide. So are herbicides also regulated under? Yes, herbicides are definitely, con uh, that's a class of chem mm -hmm. chemicals regulated under FIFRA. Uh, herbicides, um, they get the little critters in, in soil. Uh, I don't know of any offhand, but. Uh, but herbicides, antimicrobials, rodenticides are considered pests or, or, or pesticide chemicals that go after rodents, and gophers, and um, ver invertebrate or vertebrate animals that are destructive to crops and you know might give rise to some sort of vector as rats infestation and mice infestation do. So herbicides, rodenticides, antimicrobials, conventional pesticides, uh, insecticides are all considered part of the pesticide community. I just wanted to ask um, about in a future situation with all of the state regulations coming down about the bus, how uh, a task of prevention <laughs> situation may or may not come about. Preemption was a major issue when Lautenberg was being amended or was Lautenberg was being uh, crafted by, uh, by advocates of all stripes. Um, and preemption, of course, refers to if, if the EPA is in a space, then states are disallowed from participating in that space until the preemption clock ends. Um, that's an evolving concept under, under um, uh, TSCA implementation, particularly in, in the context of the whole chemical review, uh, because when EPA undertakes an analysis, the, the states are disallowed from participating in it until it is done, right? Um, 
I would expect, because there are very few PFOS substances that are now under review, that the states, as you've probably seen, are very, very active in identifying state-specific water standards, um, art standards that might apply to articles that contain PFAS substances or PFAS substances. Um, so in, unless and until EPA is, is more in the TASCA space, actively engaged in PFAS regulatory risk evaluation and risk management standards, there will, there will be no preemption. The, the states will continue to do as they are doing, which is regulating based on standards that are either unique or specific to jurisdictional uh, requirements or reflect the voting tendencies of the jurisdiction that is undertaking a, a particular chemical review. Uh, we have a question here for Shanika on your auto comparison. Does it show the greenhouse gas emissions from the manufacturing process and the production of raw materials? Uh, currently, no, it doesn't, it doesn't involve that, but, um, just like, um, like I spoke to, to how the green choice evaluation was done before I got there, um, that one is also, um, being, being taken a look at as well. So not by me, we have a whole nother set that, <laughs> that deals with autos, which is, is probably a good thing. <laughs> and we had another question asking. Are there better product label regulations limiting claims that a product is organic or natural versus So we have um, a whole um, food safety team um, at, at Consumer Reports. And one of those things, like I said, we work with different agencies and different parts of those that may look at those labels. Um, but we, per, we try to, um, outside of that, provide um, outreach and education, if you will. That's a, a probably a good, good um, term for it, um, either within the magazine or online as to, you know, the proper way to read a label. Um, we, we have, um, of course, um, network or TV partners um, that we work with to try to amplify out the message as well, besides just, um, just the platforms that CR has. Um, at, at, um, and in that, um, some of the spots I would say more recently have been focused on what, what does this label mean versus that? What does organic really mean in this context versus non-organic? Or if it says, you know, uh, what are some of the particular claims on it and, and, and what does that break down to? So um, that information we do at least try to, um, try to clarify uh, for consumers so that they can make better decisions. And we have another question that's directed to both of you. We've gotten a lot of comments on hoping to hear more about household chemicals like Febreze plugins, air deodorizers, or laundry additives, and how those are regulated. Well, I'll, I'll start with in any chemical that is used in a product that could be considered a household product, like when you open your underneath your sink in the kitchen, there are a bunch of chemicals, right? Or in the products that are used to sanitize your kitchen or use in your dishwasher, every one of those chemicals is reviewed by EPA um, under the TOSCA process. Uh, many of them might have not been reviewed early on, but are on the TOSCA inventory and hence are not the subject of ongoing review, but any new chemical, and there's a lot of activity in that space um, for new chemical development, because consumers, as Shanika has made abundantly clear, are very interested in using products that are greener, more sustainable, and less likely to pose any type of human health or environmental risk. So if it's a new chemical, EPA looks very specifically at what those conditions of use would be as, for example, a household cleaning agent, right? If it's a fragrance, or if it's a surfactant that makes the chemical, you know, apply and distribute, you know, more evenly, um, those are all part of the TOSCA review process as a new chemical. If it's an existing chemical and that was not reviewed, it would be reviewed in the future as a condition of use of any existing chemical that is the subject of, of review under TOSCA section six. 
and the, the, the composite mixture of the whole shoot and match, because usually a household cleaner contains a bunch of different chemicals, right? Mm -hmm. And a bunch of inerts. Yep. I know that's very inelegant, a bunch of, but if you look at a label, it has a lot of different chemical components. So the chemicals is in their totality are not reviewed by EPA. The chemical ingredients either will be reviewed prospectively or are or have been reviewed as part of a new chemical application um, already. In in just the, the second part of that. So as like um, you heard me say, green choice evolves. We, we I do get asked about detergents and all that mm -hmm. and cleaners and stuff a lot. Um, we'll move into that space and, and some of the information that, that comes out of those reviews are taken into account. One, because if there's something that is 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 a bit more, I guess, toxic or hazardous that, that might be in place. Or um, like for instance, with um, with the um, the raid that was finalized with the uh, removal of um, refrigerants um, with, um, out of like air conditioning, mm -hmm. well, breaking, um, reducing the the um, production of those those things. You know, even when you look at like the disposal of that, you have to take that into account. Like, is the refrigerant has to be removed? Does it leak? It, you know, all of those factors do come into play. So. Um, so some of those reviews or some of the end results of those reviews, you, you do take into account that information. So, so EPA has like a safer choice mm -hmm. program and chemicals that enter into the program and are given this much sought after designation of a safer choice chemical. And I'm sure that that election of being a safer choice chemical might be Play viewed favorably mm -hmm. by a consumer report analysis of a, of a product that contains a safer choice chemical. And similarly, I don't think you, you address pesticides, but the reduced risk pesticide program is you know, another attribute of a product that is very much sought after by manufacturers and mm -hmm. users of chemicals because it's thought to pose you know, minimum risk to human health and the environment. Right. And that designation is EPA's way of rewarding innovation that has resulted in a product that poses diminished or, or minimum risk. So more on the future of regulation. Someone is asking, with all the studies that we've seen come out, do you think we will see a regulation limiting the value soon? Or is the industry shifting without the need for regulation? Well, th there are phthalates being regulated now. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, phthalates are a particular class of chemicals that have been the subject of, of review by EPA for, for quite, a, quite a while. But as is often the case, whenever you have a class of chemicals that are perceived to pose risk, whether it's PFASs, which are the kind of chemical class du jour, PFAS are being regulated aggressively under uh, the Biden administration's PFAS strategic roadmap that came out last year. Uh, they're being addressed internationally by the OECD and jurisdictions mm -hmm. everywhere. You know, Entities that are mindful of the implications of manufacturing products that contain substances that are thought to pose risk by a class, whether it's phthalates or PFASs or flame retardants, mm -hmm. you know, there is a significant market incentive to diminish the use and reliance upon those chemicals, not because of the regulatory controls, but because of the perception that they pose unreasonable risk. And so those are huge market drivers. And I'm sure you, you see that through your analyses at, at Consumer Reports, yes. Definitely. Um, and and some, sometimes, um, of course, uh, like you hear me in particular talk about food safety and stuff, we'll undertake special um, investigations or experimentation to really, to see if, if you know, um, you know, you get a certain concentration from this source versus that source and to kind of have that basis of information again, so our policy arm, we can go and push. And it's not just pushing from a point of, we heard, it's pushing from a point of our data tells us this right. and it needs to be addressed. So we're not a compliance shop, that's not what we do. But we are, um, and as part of our mission is um, mitigating risk 
for people, like from a safety, from a safety perspective. And that could be ingestion of a chemical, being exposed to a chemical, or just, um, you know, I think one of the things we, we looked at more recently is like refrigerator, refrigerators top one over. Just, you know, some of the basic safety um, pieces that go, on, go hand in hand with that. I just wanted a footnote because Shanika raised a very good point that sometimes there is this mentality that chemicals in a broad class are all indiscriminately deemed bad. Um, you know, the OECD defines PFAS as much more generously than EPA does under its working definition of PFAS as articulated in the TSCA section 8A7 proposed reporting rule. I think under that definition, I've heard anywhere from 2,200 to 5,000 chemical mm -hmm. substances are broadly defined as PFASs. So it's this huge universe of substances that are in an enormous diversity of products. Um, the OECD defines it differently and many more chemicals are brought tens mm -hmm. of thousands of chemicals. Mm -hmm. So if you're in the private sector and you're trying to you know, think your way through long-term <laughs> planning. Do you go for the, the more generous OECD definition or stick with the EPA? You know, there probably is going to be some convergence down the road and EPA is already making noises to that effect. But I, I really think Shanika's point about being science-driven is important. The fact that something is a PFAS, given the extraordinary molecular and chemical diversity mm -hmm. of the chemicals in that class of chemicals should not necessarily elicit a conclusion that it is bad for all cases and all applications under all circumstances. You know, we are, EPA is a science-driven organization. Consumer Product Safety Commission is a science-driven organization. FDA, OSHA, mm -hmm. Consumer Reports, you know, relies upon science, not just labels. Um, and, and some of us are concerned with throwing everything in the kitchen sink into this great big bucket of PFAS and not recognizing that PFAS is also provide a lot of important functionalities and can be used without presenting an exposure risk, either production-wise, in use, and upon end of cycle or end of use disposal. Um, but sometimes those points are very hard to make when we know that PFAS has a very long legacy of destructive persistent bioaccumulation that you know exposure to which under many circumstances can give rise to environmental and human health concerns we have another epa question so before the talk amendments a typical epa region had about one full-time employee implementing Tosca. Uh, have there been more workers added to implement the new law and if so how many Wow, that's an excellent question. Um, I don't know the answer to the regional staffing of TSCA. Most of the, the analytical work for purposes of section four testing, section five new chemical, section six risk evaluation, section eight data generation and record keeping, and 12 and 13 import and export are all under headquarters. Mm -hmm. The OPPT, the Office of Pollution Prevention and Toxics, and the Office of Chemical Safety and Pollution Prevention is kind of the nerve center of TSCA here in D.C. Mm -hmm. The regional offices are tasked with enforcement and rely to a very large extent working with their colleagues in Washington to make difficult determinations with respect to chemical identity. If there's a, a TSCA Section 5 SNR violation alleged or um, something along those lines. So my sense is that in a perfect world, Dr. Friedhoff would love to have more regional boots on the ground. Mm -hmm. uh, whether the, the coffers allow for that, I, I don't know. Um, but enforcement is largely you know, generated by regional offices, the 10 regional offices, sometimes with some help by state agencies who are deputized to assist. Mm -hmm. But the decision making, the rule making, and the scientific technical analysis is very much concentrated at headquarters. Uh, we had one last question from the online audience, uh, just asking if you could go over the Superfund tasks again. Again? <laughs> <laughs> 
You know, we, um, and I'm not trying to dodge the question, but the, the, the Superfund excise tax, you know, many years ago, when Superfund or the Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation and Liability Act, CERCLA, came into being back in 86, there was a tax applied to chemical substances um, and um, under, under the mm -hmm. IRS code. And it, that tax was used and assessed on chemical manufacturers and the manufacturers of certain products, okay? And it was used to collect a, a bucket of money to be used to collect um, and deploy to clean up legacy mm -hmm. Superfund sites that might have been abandoned or closed years ago and were identified by EPA under Superfund or CERCLA mm -hmm. to pose exposure risk and needed to be cleaned up, right? So that excise tax was used to jumpstart that cleanup program. The tax lapsed in 1995, I believe. And more recently, uh, starting this year, um, an excise tax has been reapplied to certain chemical substances identified by the IRS um, and subject to this excise tax. And I know July 1 was a date on or before which uh, entities subject to the tax were required to kind of project what their tax liability would be and pay some or all of it. Um, there's significant confusion right now about what's taxable, what tax applies and who pays. Um, and the IRS is in the process of issuing guidance on that. What I would urge you to do is number one, we. We um, circulated yesterday a memorandum on the excise tax generally. If you go to our website at www.lawbc.com, that might be helpful. And it leads you to the various guidances that the IRS is trying to get out to help the regulated community understand what is taxable, who pays it, and what products might need to be subject to the tax if it includes a taxable substance, okay? Um, the IRS has promised to get additional guidance out because it is a very sticky wicket right now, which is a polite way of saying it's a food fight out there because the IRS was required by law to get the tax going. Mm -hmm. But again, in the absence of guidance, it left a lot of people in a quandary as to what was paid or what needed to be paid and by when. So the, the IRS also has a website. If you just put in IRS excise tax, a chemical excise tax, you can get um, additional information that way or go to our website and, and see our memo on the excise tax. So I, I hope that's helpful, but I don't want to get out above my skis and, <laughs> and try to identify all 42 chemical substances that are identified in that. Um, but the contours are, you know, it retired back in 95. It's back in place now. And people have current obligations if you're subject to it right now under the July 1, 2022 deadline. Thank you so much for all your questions, everyone. Um, we have about 10 minutes left, so I will ask a couple of my prepared questions that I think are relevant to the discussion we've already been mm -hmm. having. So the first one's for you, Lynn, um, and we've been talking about how EPA is regulating chemicals and articles mm -hmm. um, more, much more regularly than they used to be doing. Um, is there something that you think EPA should be doing? And if so, what? Well, an article, as many of you probably know, is a, another word for like a finished good or, or manufactured product. This, this is an article. Um, you have articles all over this room here. You're, you use articles every single day. And articles necessarily contain chemicals that were used in the manufacture of the article. So as um, Madison indicated, for many, many years, EPA declined to regulate articles on the theory that Consumer Product Safety Commission might be a better agency or gosh, regulating chemicals and articles is just too darn hard to figure out who, who should, or there was a misperception that articles pose no risk when used as intended. Mm -hmm. So for a long time, under TSCA Section 5, significant new use restrictions did not apply to the chemical substance when used in an article. Section 8, chemical data reporting, you don't have to report on the chemical if it's in, uh, if it's in an article. Uh, so there are lots of, of exemptions under TSCA historically that backed articles out of the equation. So to your question, 
Should EPA be regulating chemicals and articles? In my view, it is a, it's fair game. We know a heck of a lot more now about, for example, surface treatments on carpets. You know, if kids crawl around on, park, mm -hmm. talk, on, toss, on a carpet, a carpet is an article. But if it's off-gassing a chemical that was used to treat the, the, the carpet to resist stains mm -hmm. or maintain its integrity, that's an exposure pathway that is meritorious of EPA's legitimate review under TSCA, both for Section 5 new chemical review and Section 6 review of existing chemicals when products are used as intended. Um, so I think the agency is well uh, supported in reviewing chemicals and obtaining information on chemicals and articles, the most recent example of which, as I noted a minute ago, um, under the National Defense Authorization Act, NDAA, mm -hmm. EPA was compelled in an amendment to TSCA, not, not created by EPA, but by uh, the NDAA, to collect information on PFASs in chemicals or keep PFAS chemical generation, but also in articles. And the data request goes back 10 years. So in other words, if you are subject to a reporting obligation under TSCA section 8A7, when the rule is issued in final, as is expected to, I think late this year or early next, um, you will need to report on the presence of PFASs as defined in that rule in articles going back 10 years. And so EPA is legitimately using its authority to generate data to help it identify risk priorities in its ongoing review of PFASs. So it's part of both the legal requirement of 8A7 and part of the Biden administration's um, uh, PFAS strategic plan to find out where these critters are and regulate them in a way that uh, the agency um, is required to do. So long-winded way of saying, yes, EPA has the authority. Historically, it has chosen not to exercise it. It knows a lot more now than it did before. Articles can give rise to exposures, and the agency's investigation and review of uh, chemicals and articles is certainly within its jurisdictional mandate. And then, Shanika, I have a question for you that's kind of similar to one earlier. So we were talking about how uh, regional offices of EPA can coordinate with DC, but how does um, Consumer Reports coordinate with states in their efforts to prioritize and review consumer products and sustainability issues? I would say statewide, um, I would say probably coordination is, is, is a very strong word there. Mm -hmm. uh, if we're working with the states, um, it's typically, you know, where we see, like, for instance, um, a right to repair bill, right? So, so that's a good, um, good example. So right to repair is essentially um, making sure that the consumer has the right to choose who they would like to repair their appliance. It doesn't necessarily have to be the main factor, right? It could be the repair shop down the street. Right. For a long time, it was thought that, well, if you get the repair guy down the street to repair it, your warranty is null and void at that point. And that's not the case. Right. So that's the parts of parts of a bill that comes up and comes down. But certain certain aspects of, of it has been passed. Now, what Consumer Reports will do is on the federal side of things, we'll have our um, our folks that go on the Hill that give testimony. Um, for different pieces and different committees um, as to why this bill is important, why do you need to pass it, you know, all the same things. We'll do the same thing at the state level, right, um, for the individual state legislatures to pass a law that may um, apply to their constituents. So, for instance, for right to repair, Massachusetts has already passed said law, right, and then we work to we work to get that same law passed in more states. Um, so it's not so it's not really setting up a coordination, if you will, with that state. It's more of um, we we see this issue, we see this bill has either been introduced or could be introduced to the legislature, and how do we help push that forward? Um, you see that a lot more. Um, Sorry, we're right to repair. Um, for products, but um, we also do the same thing when it comes to like gas standards, 
for instance, and, and those types of things, which, which um, some individual state legislatures can control a, a certain percentage of this or a certain percentage of that. So we, we have some very distinct issues, then we have broader issues that, that, will, that will push forward, but coordinating with them isn't, isn't one of the top priorities um, there from that standpoint. We only have a few minutes left. So in closing, I will um, just ask you all if there's anything you would like to share or share with our audience if they're interested in learning more about this or getting more involved with product circulation. Well, I've already extended an open-ended invitation to speak with anybody that is looking at careers in this space, because I think it's a wonderful opportunity to work. Our firm maintains more scientists than it does lawyers. We have more PhD toxicologists and chemists than legal beagles, because in order to get this right, you need skill sets that draw upon the science community, the regulatory policy community, and the legal community. It's really a fascinating area. Plus, we have we maintain a Tosca blog, we maintain a FIFR blog, we maintain a bio-based blog, a nano blog, and a reach blog, the counterpart to Tosca in Europe. Uh, so we have all kinds of information on our website, which is free, and we generate this information to help stakeholders of all stripes um, learn more about these very important issues that, you know, affect all of us at a very personal level. Shanika? Um, I would just say out there that, um, you know, with Consumer Reports, some folks just think we're just ratings, that's all we do. Um, but it's upon working there, you can learn that there's so, so many different facets um, to our work. So, um, you know, I would say folks go to CR.org, um, see the types of things that we offer that go beyond the ratings. Um, we're moving more into like, for instance, the equity space. And um, one of the articles that came out, I would say mid last year um, was about how Amazon um, warehouses have expanded um, between 2018 and 2020. You know, um, some of the main spots of when this pandemic was at its height and how communities are impacted by that. And that is a mix of, yes, consumer goods and what can we do from that standpoint to, you know, kind of reduce the, the overall intake, but also it brings in the environmental justice piece of, of those types of exposures that certain communities could be experiencing um, from an increased standpoint of traffic and not just in the space where it's just Amazon, it could be FedEx, it could be whomever. And, um, we also participate in those types of stories because from a corporation change of how can we talk and work to help communities in different spaces, um, that is something that also stands very important to the organization. So um, I, I say, you know, of course, check it out. Um, <laughs> there, like I said, there's different stories, there's different articles about a lot of things and there's um, definitely more to come. Thank you so much. Thank you both. Thank you, Lynn and Shika. Thank you, Matt. Thank and thanks to ELR Thank for hosting us. Thank you to our audience. And again, check out the last two sessions of Summer School if you're interested next Thursday and the following Thursday. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day. Thank you to our audience. Thank you, guys. <laughs> we all made it. <laughs> the few, the brave, <laughs> the ELI. That's right.